This presentation, which covers the utility of Wabane in the treatment of cardiovascular disease states, is designed for practitioners of integrative medicine, particularly those of you with whom I co-manage patients. Roughly two years ago, I began recommending Wabane to my patients and soon thereafter to our patients, and in my notes to you indicated that a presentation will be forthcoming. This has taken me some time, as when I read articles on Wabane, intellectual doors open and I feel compelled to walk through them and learn more. But it's been two years, and some of you are starting to retire on me, and I want you to know what I know about this substance. Thus, this presentation, which will serve as an overview. Companion presentations, where I go into more detail on the physiology and present additional clinical studies are in the works, along with a presentation on the 150-year history of Wabane, along with a presentation designed for patients. Of course, as our patients are the smartest patients in the world, they'll probably be able to follow along with this discussion. A euphemistic title for this presentation could be Wabane, not your father's digitalis. Stated otherwise, with all due respect to Dr. Withering, we're going to pour out our foxglove tea because it's time for Digitalis to move over and to let Wabane, the natural ligand of the sodium potassium ATPase cation pump and signal transduction system to take over. ATPase expression is critical in cardiovascular health. As we'll discuss, ATPase activity is pathologically downregulated in the majority of our patients on the basis of chronic hyperinsulinemia or over elaboration of catecholamines or reactive oxygen species. In this situation, supplemental Wabane will upregulate ATPase expression, rectifying this imbalance and attenuating symptoms in our patients. A more formal title might be Wabane in Cardiovascular Medicine. My name is Jim Roberts. I describe myself as a practitioner of integrative cardiology, suggesting that I'm an open-minded and innovative physician. And indeed I am. But Wabane has been used in cardiovascular medicine for over 100 years, and I'm just now getting involved. But better late than never, as my patients with macro and microvascular ischemia, atrial arrhythmia, and heart failure are benefiting considerably from this incredibly safe natural product that improves cardiovascular physiology in a fashion that cannot be recapitulated with standard pharmaceutical or anatomy altering interventions. Your patients may benefit as well as may you, and I want you to know all that I've learned. Let's start with a case study involving the patient whose treatment response first illustrated to me the importance of ATPase physiology and the clinical benefit of Wabane, or perhaps I should say, Wabane replacement therapy. MR is a 71-year-old diabetes and thus hyperinsulinemic, white male non-smoker with hypertension, a modest elevation creatinine, statin intolerance, and 20 to 30 percent corneal lesions by angiography 10 years earlier. He presents to his integrated practitioner in Ann Arbor in March of 2018 with recent onset but now stable angina. He walks five and a half minutes on the treadmill. There's ST depression or normal wall motion. This scenario suggests that cornea insufficiency is present but that it's not severe or extensive, and that we have the luxury of time to focus on risk factor reduction as opposed to proceeding directly with angiography and intervention, and we begin to work towards that end. I saw him in June and began him on the toprolol and a long acting nitrate, and his chest pain improved, but it did not fully resolve. Later that, that month, he destabilized. He was hospitalized in Ann Arbor, and because he's having pain on meds, angiography was carried out, and it looked really good. His right coronary artery was normal. His left main's okay. The LAD and the diagonals look good. The circ is fine, but he has a 80-90% narrowing in a relatively small marginal branch of the circumflex. Now, this is a puny little vessel. It should not be causing angina. It should have collateralized, but it didn't. He's having pain, so they placed a stent, which made perfect sense to me. He comes back to see me a month later, and while the, the engine improved after the stent, it's back. 
he's not feeling so good. His EKG looks okay, so he's not thrombosing the stent. We do another stress test. He goes nearly eight minutes. He has angina, ST depression, and equivocal wall motion abnormality. And I reassured him that he was okay. I couldn't think of anything else to do. Um, a few months later, he destabilizes Ann Arbor. He walks nine minutes on the treadmill. He has ST depression, normal perfusion, but because of his recurrent pain, androgravy is repeated, the stent looks great. So he comes back to see me and peripheral endothelial function was intact, but there's a scenario where post stent placement in the distal vessel, there can be endothelial dysfunction. So we put on an arginine and enos cofactors. He didn't get better. Xanthine oxidase pathologically upregulates an ischemic vessel, and you're wasting oxygen to make superoxide. So we added allopurinol, and that blunts angina in clinical trials. It had no benefit here. So I'm thinking, gee, maybe he has microvascular ischemia, whatever the heck that is. Now, I've been involved with the ECP for 25 years, and a paper was published about 10 years ago, a series of patients with microvascular ischemia many of whom benefited from ECP, and I've treated a handful of these patients, and some get better, some don't, so we thought we ought to try it, and we treat him, and he's really not getting much out of it. At this point, I'm learning about Wavane for the first time two years ago. Why not add it in? Nothing else is working. Three milligrams, three times a day. We completed ECP. His pain is gone. So was it the Wavane or the ECP? So we stopped the Wavane, the pain comes back. Put him back on Wavane, pain's resolved. He's staying on Wabane. He's doing great. So what is this man's corny diagnosis? Was drug therapy and stent placement really necessary? By what mechanism or mechanisms did Wabane resolve his refractory angina? And what are the implications to all of our other patients? What are the clinical effects of Wabane, often referred to as G. stropanthin or stropanthus in cardiovascular disease? Based upon the English language literature, I can say with a high degree of certainty that Wabin is of well-documented and significant value in reducing symptoms and improving effort capacity in patients with standard obstructive epicardial coronary disease. Wabin improves functional status in patients with heart failure due to pump dysfunction or valvular insufficiency. Wabin rapidly resolves symptoms in patients like our patient MR with microvascular ischemia. He was experiencing ischemia due to a functional downregulation in sodium potassium ATPase ion pump function due to chronic hyperinsulinemia as opposed to ischemia on the basis of an obstructed blood vessel. This functional abnormality was rapidly resolved with wobbing, thus his angina decreased by the end of the day with, when we began wobbing. Wabane improves functional status in patients with atrial fib. It provides a modest reduction in heart rate, less so than with digoxin, but because it improves mitochondrial function, tolerance to atrial fib is enhanced. Likely benefits of Wabane, derived from German papers that have not been translated and thus not fully read by myself, or extrapolating the benefits of Wabane in animal models of human cardiovascular disease states, Wabane reduces mortality and improves outcome in acute infarction. Here one takes 6 to 12 milligrams of Wabane sublingually with the onset of chest pain. Chronic Wabane use should decrease the risk of infarction and should reduce muscle loss and improve outcome if a Wabane-treated patient experiences myocardial injury. Preoperative Wabane improves outcome in on-pump open-heart surgery and was used for that indication by German surgeons in the 70s. Wabane should protect against the development of heart failure and pressure overload states, extrapolating from animal models of hypertensive heart disease and aortic stenosis. Untranslated German papers describe a benefit of Wabane in mood. It improves sense of optimism and it enhances athletic performance. And this shouldn't surprise us because the sodium potassium ATPase ion pump and signal transduction system is present on the cell membrane of every cell in the body. We can use the response to Wabane to differentiate cardiac from non-cardiac symptoms in the office. And I'm using this with my own patient. If a patient comes in and they're experiencing symptoms, I will give them a sublingual Wabane with a sip of water. Five minutes later, I ask, how are you feeling? 
And if they say, gee, doc, I'm feeling a lot better. What's in that pill? That suggests that their current symptoms are ischemic or due to pump dysfunction. Now, a negative response doesn't mean they don't have heart disease, but it suggests that their current symptoms are not cardiac in nature. IV Wabing can be used to treat perioperative shock and was used for that indication in Germany and the United States in the pre-catecholamine therapy era. Standard dose is three milligrams three times a day, best on an empty stomach. The capsule can be opened, the powder sprinkled under the tongue, kind of swished around and then swallowed. The dose can be increased to six milligrams three times a day. We're not going to hurt anybody with Wabing six milligrams three times a day. In acute MI, the dose is six to 12 milligrams sublingually with the onset of pain. How does Wabing work? What are the physiologic effects of Wabing that mediate its clinical benefits? Wabing enhances mitochondrial function. We make more ATP without a concomitant increase in oxygen requirement. Myocardial contractility improves without an increased need for oxygenated blood. Wabing promotes utilization as opposed to the generation of lactic acid when the heart is metabolically strained, such as in corneal insufficiency, hypoxia, or experimental models of sepsis or hemorrhagic shock. Wabing improves uptake and assimilation of glucose synergizing with insulin when aerobic energy generation is compromised, such as acute myocardial injury. Wabane stimulates parasympathetic function and downregulates sympathetic function, lowering levels of norepinephrine so we get more rest and repair and less fight or flight. As does vigorous exercise or repetitive brief episodes of ischemia, Wabing conditions the mitochondria, rendering the mitochondria more resilient, lessening the risk of energy failure and cell loss when the heart is stressed by oxygen insufficiency, catecholamine excess, infection or inflammation. Plasticity of red cells and platelets is enhanced, improving microcircuitry flow. In animal models and in vitro studies, Wabane improves nitric oxide generation and endothelial function. Wabane initiates protein synthesis. Wabane may mediate some benefits of exercise. Wabane in experimental inflammatory conditions will limit cytokine generation, and Wabane is necessary for prenatal development. Wabane is not a drug. Rather, Wabane is a hormone, and it shares the chemical structure of other endogenous hormones. Wabane is the natural ligand and stimulator of the sodium potassium ATPase ion pump and signaling system. This is a schematic of the ATPase and its anchoring proteins, downstream tyrosine kinases, and effector organelles. Our patients are suffering from pathologic downregulation of the system on the basis of chronic over-elaboration of insulin and stress hormones. In this situation, Wabane hormone replacement therapy will restore normal pump function and provide beneficial clinical effects. Wabane and digitalis are termed cardiotonic steroids. They are endogenous to the human body. There are receptors for Wabane and digitalis in the human body. Plants will make these molecules. We can thus use plant extracts as medicinal agents. Medicinal Wabane is an extract of the Stropanthus gratis plant. This is a woody clinging vine found in tropical Africa and in Taiwan, Trinidad and Tobago. In the mythology of the wild tribe of the upper Volta, Stropanthus was gift of the gods. It was set from paradise to earth to heal or punish people according to merit. The milky exudate and seeds of the Stropanthus plant in low doses were medicinal, used to treat fever, infection, leprosy, and malaria. It provided a mild hypoglycemic action. While high doses were lethal, it was used as arrow smear in combat and in hunting. This is Sir Jonathan Kirk, who, as it turns out, is the great-great-grandfather of my good friend and colleague, Michigan osteopathic physician R.H. Poling. Now, like Poling, Kirk was a Renaissance man. He was a botanist, a naturalist, and along with David Livingston, co-administrator of the British uh, um, colony of Zanzibar, and together they're credited with abolishing the slave trade on the west coast of Africa.
Kirk was fascinated that the extract of the stropanthus plant could be healing and lethal. Would there be a role for stropanthus extract in European botanical medicine? So in the practice of botany at the time, one would brush the plant and the particulate matter would be dissolved in water, acetone, or alcohol and its chemical properties um, studied. So Kirk took his brushings and then with attention to scientific rigor that makes little sense unless perhaps there's a genetic component, he stored his botanical brush and the poison tipped arrows with his personal toiletries. Now, Kirk had Valley Fever, a viral illness that all Europeans would contract when they entered this area of Africa. So he gets up one morning to brush his teeth and he noticed this bitter taste on the toothbrush. And then all of a sudden his palpitations resolve. And he was thus the first European to experience the vagal mimic effects of Wabane. 10 years later, Wabane is being used in European botanical medicine as an alternative to foxglove tea. Stropanthus is healing, but stropanthus is also lethal. Is the effect determined by the gods or is the effect determined by the dose? Paracelsus taught us that all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes that a thing is a poison. Paracelsus is right. Wabane stimulates the pump, which activates IP3R, which is short for the inositol 145 triphosphate receptor signaling pathway, which in turn creates oscillations of intracytoplasmic calcium. There is an AM and FM to this calcium oscillation modulation. In this fashion, Wabane can influence many different pathways within the cell. Wabane is found in our body at the nanomolar level. In the absence of Wabane, there's no calcium cycling. As we increase the concentration of Wabane, we see an increased frequency and amplitude of the calcium oscillations. Low level Wabane will lead to proliferation of endothelial cells. Pathologic levels of Wabane will destroy the cells. If we give too much Wabane, rather than stimulate, we can actually poison the pump, and this leads to excessive intracytoplasmic calcium and organelle failure. Digitalis toxicity relates to poisoning of the pump. Oral Wabane cannot poison the pump. The only way we can poison the pump and lead to pathological calcium accumulation would be with excessive doses of IV Wabane, which of course we're not going to be utilizing. Wabane is synthesized in the hypothalamus, the zona fasciculata of the adrenals, and at high levels within the placenta. Low maternal Wabane levels in animals and in humans correlates with low for gestational age birth weight. Wabane levels rise acutely in response to stress hormones such as catecholamines and angiotensin II or the other physiologic cues such as growth hormone. If you go for a run, you get your heart rate up, your Wabane level will rise 40 fold, except if you're taking beta blockers or ACE inhibitors that will blunt the physiologic rise in Wabane in response to exercise stress. This study was done in animals, but it likely holds in humans. High levels of Wabane are seen as systemic hypertension. When Wabane was first discovered, it was described as the hypertensive natriuretic factor in that it does promote sodium excretion at the level of the kidney, but it's associated with high blood pressure. High dose Wabane induces hypertension in animal models. Not low dose Wabane, but high dose Wabane. High dose Wabane would poison the pump. Low dose Wabane does not poison the pump. Low dose IV Wabane does not increase blood pressure and healthy controls. Anti-Wabane drug therapy was tried. It does not lower blood pressure in hypertensive humans. The highest levels are seen in heart failure and renal failure. Increasing levels correlate with worsening outcome. Wabane was felt to be etiologic in hypertension, renal failure, and heart failure. That is incorrect. Wabane is not etiologic in cardiovascular pathology. Rather, increased elaboration of endogenous Wabane is compensatory. The body is trying to treat itself similar to B-type natriuretic peptide. However, in our patients, the compensation is inadequate. 
because the sodium potassium ATPase is so severely downregulated. This is the structure of the ATPase. This is the Wabane binding site. These are protein phosphorylation sites through which other hormones can increase or decrease the activity of the ATPase. There's, the pump is composed of alpha and beta units. There's four subtypes of the alpha unit. The alpha unit is catalytic. There's alpha 1, 2, 3, and 4 that respond differentially to Wabane. The beta subunits um, anchor the catalytic sites into the cell membrane. There's an FXYD site that's involved in enzyme maturation. Now, there'll be different differential expression of alpha subunits with differential sensitivity to Wabane at different sites of the cell membrane, different tissue systems, and in different species. Thus, when you read about Wabane, it's very confusing. A dose of Wabane that is stimulatory in one ammo model will be inhibitory in another. Wabane levels that are stimulatory in the cardiovascular system may be inhibitory in another system because of the differential expression of the alpha subunits. ATPase function and ATPase sensitivity to the stimulatory effects of Wabane will be acutely increased by catecholamines, acetylcholine, and insulin. Conversely, chronic overlaboration of catecholamines, insulin, and free radical species will downregulate ATPase function and sensitivity to Wabane. And of course, this is the phenotype of most of our patients. Our diabetes, hypertensive, insulin insensitive patients suffer from functional downregulation of ATPase activity. In this scenario, exogenous Wabane will improve ATPase function and restore proper cardiovascular physiology. The pump has different functions depending upon its anchoring proteins and associated downstream tyrosine kinases. So the pump at different sites in the cell membrane will have different functions. We can divide this up into the ion pump, the plasmarosome, and the signalosome. The signalosome refers to the presence of the ATPase within the cavioli. The cavioli is an invagination within the endothelial cell membrane where a great deal of our biology, including nitric oxide generation, is conducted. Now at this site, the ATPase inhibits SRC protein kinase. When Wabane interacts with the ATPase, SRC kinase is disinhibited, and this leads to a chain reaction of protein phosphorylation events that activate multiple cellular enzyme pathways. If you incubate monkey kidney cells with Wabane, within 10 to 20 minutes, you'll see several thousand phosphorylation events on over a thousand intracellular proteins. Thus, Wabane is rapidly influencing enzyme function, including that of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. If you incubate human umbilical vein endothelial cells with Wabane, you will observe ENOS translocation and thus functional activation of nitric oxide synthase, increased elaboration of nitric oxide, enhanced endothelial tone. The pathway here is that Wabane interacts with the pump. That leads to phosphorylation of PI3K, which is phosphoinositol kinase, that leads to phosphorylation of AKT, otherwise known as protein kinase B, which leads to phosphorylation of a specific serine residue in ENOS. This is an upregulating event. We see increased elaboration of nitric oxide, improved endothelial function. Wabine initiates protein transcription. Calcium oscillations downstream from IP3R leads to translocation of nuclear factor kappa beta into the nucleus. Now we think of nuclear factor kappa beta as a bad guy in that it initiates generation of Th1 cytokines in inflammatory conditions, but nuclear factor kappa beta is also involved in the generation of multiple structural proteins and cellular enzymes. If you treat a pregnant animal with anti wabane antibodies, the offspring will be small for gestational age, and they will have small and dysfunctional kidneys and livers and large and dysfunctional hearts. Wabane enhances mitochondrial function. 
such that we make more ATP without a concomitant increase in oxygen requirement. Wabane delays or obviates the generation of lactic acid when the heart is under strain or when the organism is under strain, such as in experimental endotoxic or hemorrhagic shock. Wabane promotes conditioning, rendering us less sensitive to the adverse effects of hypoxia. Wabane turns us into pearl divers. The pathway here is downstream from ENOS. It involves cyclo-GMP, protein kinase G epsilon, which activates a structure called the mitochondrial potassium ATP channel, which inhibits the mitochondrial permeability transition pore, which mediates rupture of the mitochondrial membrane in the setting of energy failure, which sets in motion apoptosis, which leads to cellular death. Just as in the case of German miners, Wabane decreases experimental infarct size. Wabane blunts hypertension in animal models of acute unilateral renal artery occlusion. The Langdenhorff heart model involves explaining an animal heart, supporting in a perfusion chamber, and if the heart is supplied with oxygenated blood, systolic function will be normal. If you shut off the oxygen supply, systolic function ceases, if the animal has been pretreated with Wabane during reperfusion, the recovery of systolic function is more rapid and complete. There's a blunting in the rise in end diastolic pressure, less release of cardiac enzymes. In this model, you can support a heart more or less indefinitely in the absence of oxygen if you supply the heart with adequate glucose and insulin to support anaerobic energy generation and a buffer to neutralize metabolic acids so generated. Wabane and acetylcholine will synergize with insulin in supporting glucose metabolism. Wabane also helps delay the generation of lactic acid. This explains how Wabane will decrease infarct size if taken with the onset of chest pain in our patients. In an animal model of acute ischemic injury, both Wabane and isoproteranol will improve cardiac output. Isoprel will work by enhancing contractility in the normally perfused zones. In the ischemic zone, however, oxygen requirement will increase, there'll be increased generation of metabolic acids, a larger infarct size, more pronounced ST segment elevation. Conversely, Wabane will enhance ATP generation. Wabane will spare oxygen. Wabane will decrease the degree of lactic acid generated. Wabane will decrease infarct size. The pressure volume relationship is disturbed with acute ischemic injury and aggravated further by the isoprel whip. The relationship is partially recovered with Wabane. Wabing will decrease infarct size and improve outcome in this animal model of acute injury and in our patients. Um, Wabing blunts metabolic acidosis. Cell loss and cardiovascular disease is not due solely to oxygen deficiency. Cellular autodigestion is triggered by metabolic acidosis. This could be due to oxygen deficiency or increased oxygen energy demand, sepsis, catecholamine storm, tachycephalus, cardiomyopathy, cocaine, induced infarction, anemia, et cetera, or metabolic inefficiency, lack of CoQ or lack of ATPase function. Now, this guy, Manfred Van on Darn, was brilliant. He's one of the pioneers of electron microscopy. In an animal model of acute ischemic injury, the coronary would be ligated. You would administer Wabane sublingually or IV and assess the effects on myocardial pH. pH is normal in a normally perfused zone. As you enter the infarct zone, you see a drop in pH reflecting a shift from aerobic to anaerobic energy generation. So you ligate the coronary artery, metabolic acidosis will ensue, reflected in a drop in tissue pH. You administer Wabane IV, and you see a rapid and persistent recovery in tissue pH. He felt that was very important because metabolic acidosis will compromise the microcirculation, capillaries become leaky, red cells, platelets, white cells will sludge. In addition, metabolic acidosis will activate lysosomes that will release proteolytic enzymes that will digest the myocardium. Thus, the injury will become irreversible. This can be blocked with the 
timely administration of Wabane. It works in his animal model and explains how Wabane works in patients who are experiencing an infarction. Von Arden then looked at patients with congestive heart failure. They demonstrate a cardiac index that is depressed in comparison to healthy controls. He would treat them with IV and then sublingual Wabane and demonstrated an improvement in cardiac index. Here, Wabane is not dealing with acute ischemic injury or acute metabolic acidosis. Rather, Wabane is dealing with a chronic impairment in ATP generation and perhaps an element of chronic metabolic acidosis. In any event, Wabane was ameliorative in patients with congestive heart failure as it was ameliorative in his animal model of acute ischemic injury. Let's look at some clinical studies. This paper has not been translated, but it's been excerpted in multiple review articles. Dorman and colleagues in 1977 looked at 264 subjects presenting with acute myocardial infarction. In the emergency room, you administer sublingual Wabane. In two thirds, chest pain resolved within five to 10 minutes. In 21%, the pain decreased but did not fully resolve. They were later in the course of their infarction. In 15%, there was no benefit. Presumably, at that point, myocardial injury was irreversible. 1987 paper, they administered in the ER IV Wabane and IV cortisone. The idea here is to stabilize the lysosomal membrane. Uh, in their first year, 30-day mortality of 17%. They got a little bit better with, with practice. 15% mortality at 10 years. The expected mortality in Germany at that time was 26%. Wabine intravenously worked in Brazil, 9% mortality, and you would expect a 25% mortality at that time point. Here we're going to look at mortality, cardiac mortality in coal miners. So these miners are underground, 30 minutes to the surface, 90 minutes from the hospital. Between 72 and 74, miners suffered chest pain 229 times, 11 died. In 1974, the company physician had learned about Wabane. They make Wabane available in the mine for the miners to take as needed. Between 74 and 80, the miners experienced chest pain 280 times. They take oral Wabane right there on the spot, zero mortality and no side effects. Indeed, Wabane will be of great value in the treatment of acute myocardial infarction. The sodium potassium ATPase is our primary ion pump. We spend between 20 and 60% of our ATP energy pumping ions against their concentration gradient to create an electrical chemical gradient across the cell membrane and across the membranes of intracellular organelles. The electrochemical gradient provides potential energy that facilitates the passive transfer of other charged substances across the cell membrane. The sodium potassium ATPase hydrolyzes one ATP to provide energy to pump three sodiums out and three potassiums in, provided the ATPase is functioning normally. Let's look at ATPase activity in diabetes. So the ATPase pump size against their concentration gradient, requires hydrolysis of ATP, energy is released as heat, the ATP needs to be reconstituted by burning glucose or fatty acids. ATPase activity determines or at least influences cell volume, cell membrane electrical chemical gradient, absorptive processes in the GI tract and kidneys, and metabolic rate. Let's look at ATPase expression in diabetic animal models. OB double knockout mice are leptin insensitive. They're hyperphagic. They become obese, insulin insensitive. They express high levels of glucose, insulin, triglycerides. Hypertension follows. If you treat a normal mouse with streptozotocin, that destroys the islets. They express profound insulin deficiency and severe hyperglycemia. The third experimental group, we take the OB double knockout type 2 diabetic obese mice and knock out pancreatic islet function with streptocytosin. So they are insulin insensitive, but now they are profoundly insulinopenic. You'll euthanize the animals and measure ATPase activity in liver and kidney. So in the type 2 diabetic OB double knockout mice, we see lower levels of ATPase functional expression 
in liver and kidney tissue. So ATPase activity is reduced in the type 2 diabetic mice. Consider our patients with type 2 diabetes, diabetes. They tend to be puffy. They retain fluid at the level of the kidney, and they express edema and hypertension, and they can't lose weight despite caloric restriction. Now, in the type 1 mice, you see higher levels of ATPS activity in liver and kidney tissue. In humans with type 1 diabetes, there's no tendency to fluid retention, edema, or hypertension. They're typically trim. They have no difficulty with weight loss. Now, if you take the OB double knockout mice and knock out islet function and they become um, insulinopenic, you see that their kidney ATPase level will rise. Hyperlincinemia due to insulin resistance decreases ATPase activity in these animal models of diabetes. If you remove kidney tissue from genetically normal mice and measure ATPase activity at baseline, and then you incubate the tissue with increasing doses of insulin, you'll see a suppression of ATPase activity. Insulin stimulates ATPase activity, except in the setting of chronic insulin excess, ATPS activity downregulates. Now let's look at this relationship in humans with obesity. We're going to take adipose tissue samples from trim individuals with a BMI of 25 and from obese individuals with a BMI of 42 and look at ATPS activity. And the same situation is in the OB double knockout mice. Adipose tissue ATPS activity is decreased in obese humans versus trim humans. As you would expect, there was an inverse relationship between BMI and degree of hyperlincinemia and ATPS expression. The lower the expression of ATPase, the greater would be the blood pressure. This makes sense. Obesity leads to insulin insensitivity, which leads to decreased ATPS activity and decreased cation transport, fluid retention, high blood pressure. Insulin in vivo and in vitro should increase glucose uptake and ATPS activity and does so in adipose samples from trim individuals. But insulin stimulated ATPS activity is lower in adipose tissue retrieved from obese individuals, increase above basal activity, nearly 50% in the trim, only 14% in the obese adipose tissue samples. As you would expect, insulin stimulated glucose uptake is blunted in the obese samples. Insulin normally increases glucose uptake and increases ATPase expression. However, in the situation of chronic hyperinsulinemia, we have insulin insensitivity, a blunting of insulin stimulated glucose uptake, we see decreased tonic expression of ATPase activity and a blunting in the increase in ATPase activity that would be expected in an individual who was not insulin insensitive. Overall, ATPase expression is depressed in insulin insensitive diabetes, animals, humans, or tissues. Here we're going to look specifically at ATPase cation pump function, that is you burn one ATP to pump out three sodiums and bring two potassiums in, in lean controls and obese subjects. So in the obese, red cell ATPase activity is 22% below that of lean subjects with a parallel decrease in cation transport. Thus, red cell sodium content is increased. Therefore, red cell size will be greater. Let's look at ATPase expression in syndrome X, another term for microvascular ischemia, 33 subjects, 19 with microvascular ischemia, 14 controls. The patients with syndrome X, predominantly female, they're experiencing chest pain at rest and with effort. They all have abnormal stress EKG studies. 15 of the 19 had abnormal perfusion studies. Coronaries are normal. There's no vasospasm with ergonovine infusion. They do not have obstructive atherosclerosis. They do not have Prince Metals angina. They have microvascular ischemia.
Um, here, we're going to evaluate red cell transmembrane sodium pump status. We're going to look at sodium potassium ATPase and a equal and opposite counterpart, the sodium hydrogen exchanger, which would upregulate as a compensation if the sodium potassium ATPase is downregulated. You'll also carry out glucose insulin tolerance tests on these individuals. Now, red cell pump status reflects that of the endothelium and vascular smooth muscle cells. Um, if we have sodium potassium ATPase dysfunction, we're going to have an elevation intracellular sodium. We have a passive sodium calcium exchanger. So if we have high intracellular sodium, that will be exchanged for calcium. The greater the degree of calcium present, the greater will be contractility, the greater will be vascular smooth muscle tone that would promote hypertension. The sodium hydrogen counter transport, which will upregulate in response to depressed sodium potassium ATPase function, um, will be induced by an elevated intracellular sodium. It leads to insulin insensitivity. And insulin insensitivity, in turn, causes more sodium potassium ATPase dysfunction, vascular smooth muscle hypertrophy. Thus, this phenomenon impaired sodium potassium ATPase cation function would promote fluid retention and hypertension and vasoconstriction because the vascular smooth muscle is more likely to clamp down inappropriately. So here, the syndrome X individuals have lower levels of ATPase activity, greater levels of the compensatory sodium hydrogen countertransport. Their glucose tolerance tests are normal, but in those with syndrome X, the insulin response to the glucose load was greater, so they were insulin insensitive, and their lipid panel does not look as good. ATPase activity is downregulated in diabetes on the basis of chronic hyperinsulinemia, reduced ATP utilization, and lower metabolic rate. Do our patients complain they're having trouble with weight management? Impaired cell membrane electrochemical gradient, impaired absorptive process in GI tract and kidneys, impaired cell volume control. So in diabetic microvascular ischemia, the red cells and platelets are engorged. They cannot wiggle through the capillaries. We're getting true myocardial ischemia. We can rapidly rectify the situation with Wabane. In this scenario, chest discomfort improves by the end of the day. Now, there may be other causes of microvascular ischemia, but this appears to be the key operative cause of microvascular ischemia in our diabetes patients. Let's look at the effect of Wabane in angina without what I will term demonstrable inducible ischemia. By this, I mean the patient exercise on the treadmill, they experience angina, they demonstrate ST segment depression, but it's not accompanied by a wall motion abnormality, a perfusion defect, or if we do an angiogram, we would not see an obstructive narrowing. Ten years ago, I would call this a falsely positive stress EKG study, not of clinical concern. And of course, with the knowledge that we have today, we understand that was not a correct position to take. In 2000, AE was hypertension. She required three drugs. Hypertension improved with sugar avoidance. And in around 2010, her physician put her on vitamin D. And when I first saw that, I was concerned because, gee, vitamin D will promote calcium absorption. Won't that cause coronary calcification and atherosclerosis? And then I saw who her physician was. It was Dr. Terry Chappell of Bluffton, Ohio. And Dr. Chappell's chronically 10 to 15 years out in front of me. And so I called Dr. Chappell up and he sent me the articles on vitamin D. So I started putting my patients on vitamin D. Indeed, just about everything that I do that works, I learned about from you guys. In 514, AE underwent carotid artery into be a thickness assessment. She returned above 90th percentile, but there was only mild plaque. So because of her youth, she her risk factors had not yet led to the formation of obstructive plaque, but the high IMT suggests that she's at high risk for disease progression and future events, so we need to get to work on risk factor control. And indeed, she had genomic hyperlipidemia, she had a high LPA, and we've taken steps to attenuate the adverse effects of these risk factors on arterial health. In 2016, she's experiencing chest pain with 
effort, and it's aggravated by intake of simple carbs. And herangina attenuated with a beta blocker, and it responds to nitro. How do I explain this scenario? Well, at the time, I thought hyperglycemia can cause endothelial dysfunction. That could cause angina. And I also hypothesized maybe she has GI tract yeast overgrowth, and the yeast are converting carbohydrates into reactive aldehydes that might be causing vasoconstriction. In any event, she cuts back on carbs, takes the nitro as needed, took a beta blocker, and, and she felt better. At that time, she walked two and a half minutes on the treadmill. She experienced angina, ST depression, only an equivocal wall motion abnormality. She was stable. She was not enthusiastic about angiography intervention. So we increased her beta blocker and she improved. Two years later, she walks three minutes. She's still having angina. There's ST depression, normal wall motion. Endothelial dysfunction was noted. She was treated with arginine. Her endopat score improved, but there's no change in angina. So in March of 19, we began her on Wabi, three months, three times a day, dramatic reduction in symptoms. If she sticks to a low carb diet and takes Wabi, she does great. If she stops Wabi or takes in excessive carbs, angina will recur. Her problem is microvascular ischemia due to downregulated ATPase activity, due to hyperlincinemia, and as we'll discuss later, due to chronic over-elaboration of stress hormones, catecholamines, and expression of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species. Hyperlincinemia, oxidative stress, and chronic overexpression of catecholamines will all downregulate the sodium potassium ATPase ion pump and signaling system, leading to adverse cardiovascular physiologic consequences. We can attenuate this with Wabane while we work towards resolving oxidative stress, hyperlincinemia, and chronic overexpression of catecholamines. One of the reasons that we're working together, the reason you got to know me and the reason I got to know you was this book, Reverse Heart Disease Now, that I co-wrote with my intellectual big brother, Steve Sinatra, roughly 15 years ago. Steve and I share a similar background and a similar philosophy as to how cardiovascular disease should be addressed. Steve is a few years my senior, and when I begin to learn about Wabane, I called him up and said, Steve, did you ever use Wabane? He goes, yes. When I was a cardiology fellow, we would use intravenous Wabane, similar to the way we use intravenous digoxin. We felt they shared the same mechanism of action. Well, then why did you stop using Wabane? Well, the Wabane was not an IV push. It was a 10-minute infusion. A little bit more awkward to use than digoxin, which is an IV slow push. So interest in Wabane waned and digoxin took over. Also, I think the patent on Wabane may have run out. The point here is that a single dose of Wabane will go a long way. You don't need a constant infusion of Wabane. It appears once you stimulate down-regulated HPA's function, you'll set in motion favorable biochemical pathways. The point here is that Wabane once a day will be effective. Let's return to MR, our first case study, and really MR was the first patient who I treated with Wabane two years ago to attenuate angina. MR required Wabane three milligram three times a day. I saw MR recently, he's doing great, he's angina free, with Wabane just three milligrams once a day. What explains the decrease in MR's Wabane requirement? Well, when we use Wabane to stimulate a pathologically downregulated sodium potassium ATPase ion pump and signal transduction pathway, a number of favorable sequelae will occur. First of all, we decrease cell volume, thus the red cells and platelets are smaller, they wiggle through the microcirculation, explaining the attenuation in MR's angina. When we stimulate the pump, the efficiency of energy generation is enhanced. We make more ATP without a concomitant increase in oxygen requirement. We stimulate protein transcription. We activate a number of enzymatic pathways, including ENOS, so we make more nitric oxide. The slight increase in intracellular calcium availability inhibits sympathetic and enhances parasympathetic tone. The literature is not entirely consistent, but Wabane does appear to improve insulin sensitivity. So if we rectify pathologically downregulated pump function with Wabane, we will be indirectly attenuating the phenomenon 
that caused pump dysfunction in the first place. We'll be lowering sympathetic tone. We'll be improving insulin sensitivity. We'll be decreasing oxidative stress. So in the approach to the patient, we start with Wabi and three layers three times a day. We begin to work on risk factor control. And if the patient improves, we can cut back to twice a day and then once a day while we continue to work on risk factor reduction, which is another way of stating resolving phenomenon that cause ATPase expression to be pathologically decreased. Conversely, LK requires greater than the typical doses of Wabane to maintain angina control. Presumably, the phenomena that are downregulating ATPase expression in LK are not under good control, thus she needs greater doses of Wabane. LK is a 66-year-old, previously trim, previously athletic, a professionally successful artist, never been hypertensive, she's never smoked, her L is 86, endothelial function is normal. Years ago, she had gained weight, developed type 2 diabetes, PK1C of 16. Well, she's lost weight, she's receiving medical and nutritional intervention, but she remains insulin dependent. Her typical A1C is between 8 and 9. She's been experiencing chest pain for 10 years. With COVID, her business was shut down, she's locked inside, she's experiencing a great deal of stress, aggravating her chest discomfort, so I saw her for this reason in 2000. Now, she'd seen several cardiologists in the past, all of whom had reassured her that she was not at risk for an adverse event. Her calcium score was zero in 2013. In 2018, her corny C chandrogram was totally normal. So she's not at risk, but we cannot explain her chest pain. Um, she did not respond to calcium channel blocker therapy or to a beta blocker. One of you put her on natokinase and arterial cell and that helped. Why would natokinase help? Well, natokinase degrades fibrin and fibrinogen. That lowers blood viscosity. This maneuver presumably improved microcircuitary flow and would thus attenuate angina. Arterial cell is something I need to learn more about, but my understanding is that it works at the level of the glycocalyx, the border between the endothelium and the circulation. Some Chinese studies have shown that plaque morphology improves fairly rapidly with arterial cells, so I need to learn more about it. Anyways, this helped. She requires alprazolam four times a day. Without alprazolam, she experiences tension, and this leads to tachypalpitation. So she has an imbalance, not just in her ATPase, but in neurotransmitter metabolism, and this is leading, leading, I assume, to overexpression of catecholamines, which of course will downregulate ATPase activity. So with alprazolam, natokinase, and arterial cell, she's better. We put her on Wavane. She was kind of apprehensive about all this. We started with one a day, no trouble. We worked up to three times a day. She's feeling better, and now we have her taking four to six doses per day, and she adjusts the dose to to maintain um, adequate angina control. And we'll keep working on risk factor reduction. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to back off on her Wabane dose. But for now, four to six doses per day is what is working for her. And of course, we can't hurt anybody with oral Wabane. To hurt a patient with Wabane, you'd need to use high doses of IV Wabane repetitively, which we're not going to do. Again, we're not poisoning enzyme systems we're simply rectifying a pathologically downregulated pathway. Thus, there's essentially a nil potential for toxicity with oral Wabane. Let's look at Wabane and what I'm going to term multi-hormonal ATPase downregulation. MT is a 55-year-old retired nurse, a delightful patient to work with. Despite her chronic illnesses, she retains this optimistic outlook. She's a lot of fun to have in the office. She's on the heavy side and thus insulin insensitive, chronic relapsing Lyme, uh, frequent Herxheimer's reactions with therapy. She has Addison's disease. She requires high doses of corticosteroid therapy, hypertension, tachypalpitations, depression, inflammation is hijacking serotonin towards the generation of inflammatory cytokines. She's not making serotonin, hypothyroid, sleep apnea. We carried out a stress echo study last fall to clear her for a surgical procedure. It was normal.
but she's got these tacky palpitations and a number of reasons to suspect that ATPase function may be downregulated. So I thought, well, let's just try wobbing three milligrams three times a day. And some interesting things followed. Her blood pressure fell and we dropped quinapril. Now in animal models, wabane can cause hypertension, but that's high dose wabane to poison the pump. In patients, blood pressure may fall, but it won't bottom out. Um, her heart rate fell significantly. We were able to cut back on a propranolol dose. Now, wabane affects the autonomic nervous system. It stimulates parasympathetic and it downregulates sympathetic expression. So we are not really surprised that her heart rate fell and that her blood pressure improved. We were able to cut back on medical therapy. Now, what's really interesting here is her weight fell from 186 to 169 pounds, and she does not feel that she was changing her diet. Now, I've not seen this in the literature, but it would make sense that wabbing would help with weight management. We spend roughly 20% of our ATP manning the pump. And if the pump is not functional, you don't spend that ATP, you're going to have trouble with weight management. So my theory is that we've turned ATP-based activity back on. She's now burning more ATP, and this is helping with weight management. I'm going to be watching for this in other patients. It may be that in diabetes individuals with downregulated pump function, we're going to be able to help with weight maintenance with wabane therapy. This will be our last wabine and microvascular ischemia case study, and it will lead us into an analysis of the effects of wabane on autonomic tone. JK is a 44-year-old minimally hyperlysinemic female with medically addressed hypertension, thus chronic overexpression in catecholamines with hyperlipidemia, and she presents to me a year ago with persistent chest tightness and tacky palpitations. In 2013, her cardiac echo looked good. She was hospitalized in the fall of 2016 with hypertension. She was feeling poorly, experiencing a great deal of stress. Echo showed new onset pump dysfunction. Global hypokinesis ejection 40%. She undergoes stress perfusion testing and it was normal. Two years later, her ejection fraction remains low at 45%. Now she undergoes stress testing that returns abnormal with incompletely reversible anteroceptral and inferoceptral perfusion abnormalities corresponding stress-induced hypokinesis. That leads to coronary angiography that shows normal coronaries. Her cardiologist described a paucity of small vessels, which is sort of a nonspecific finding, but he felt that she was having some form of microcirculatory disturbance. In 220, her, her ejection fraction is still 40%. I see her, she's got palpitations, elevated heart rate, poor tolerance to metoprolol. A small dose of metoprolol to deal with tachy palpitations would lead to symptomatic bradycardia and chilliness. I felt that she had ATBase dysfunction. She began wobbing three milligrams three times a day, chest tightness resolved, and of interest, her heart rate drops by 20 points. Wabane and rate control in atrial fib. RJ is one of my favorite patients, 74-year-old man, 14 years out from three-vessel stent placement. He's been in atrial fib for four years. Reasonable rate control without medical therapy. He's feeling pretty good, but not 100%. He begins wabbing three milligrams three times a day. His heart rate drops 20 points, improves sense of well-being. Again, there are AT paces throughout our physiology. And if we see an improvement in mood and other non-cardiac targets, that's not unexpected. pH really needed help with rate control. This 78-year-old woman is status post remote bypass surgery, recent surging chemotherapy for pancreatic malignancy. She goes into atrial flutter. She could only tolerate 50 milligrams of metoprolol daily. Greater doses led to symptomatic hypotension, so we're stuck with a heart rate of 115. We add in wabane, three milligrams, two to three times a day. Her heart rate drops 25 points. She's feeling better. We are providing a modest degree of rate control, and we're enhancing metabolic efficiency. With digoxin, we could provide greater rate control, but digoxin does not improve metabolic efficiency. It would not be as helpful in this situation. Can Wabane produce pathologic bradycardia? Now we use beta blockers and calcium blockers and digoxin, we can cause pathologic bradycardia. Are we gonna cause pathologic bradycardia with Wabane? Well, I was assured that we would not, but in this patient, I wanted to be absolutely certain. JR is a 92-year-old retired pediatrician who presented 
when he was roughly my age with new onset atrial fib. And this was not expected because JR had run a lot of marathons. And his echo showed posterior hypokinesis that didn't appear to be coronary because he's still running marathons. Drug therapy didn't work very well. And then we hypothesized that maybe JR had run too many marathons without any antioxidant or coenzyme Q support and damaged his myocardium. And indeed, that might have been the case. So we put him on coenzyme Q and magnesium, and he returned to sinus rhythm and remained athletic. In his mid-80s, JR um, returned to atrial fib, and he converted to sinus rhythm with dronaterone. And now he's got this funny-looking EKG, and his heart rate 61. A CT angiogram showed a 70% mid-LAD narrowing. He has a little bit of shortness of breath. And we're not interested in doing an angiogram on a 92-year-old who happens to be my father. Um, so what are we going to do? We, I thought we'd put him on Wavane, but his heart rate's kind of low. Are we going to cause patholo pathologic bradycardia? So we had him come to the office, did the EKG, had him take Wavane, nothing happened. He's on Dronaterone, he's on Wavane, and he's doing well. So with drugs, we're poisoning enzyme systems that are pathologically upregulated, and we can overdo it and cause pathologic bradycardia. With Wabane, we're not poisoning anything. We're, we're stimulating a system that is pathologically downregulated. Thus, we're not going to get into side effects as we do with standard drug therapy. Because again, Wabane is an endogenous substance. The plasmarosome refers to a region of cytoplasm where the myocyte smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which stores calcium to mediate contractility, is in close apposition to the cell membrane. Wavane works by stimulating the pump, which stimulates IP3R, which mediates calcium oscillations that fills the endoplasmic reticulum with more calcium to mediate more powerful contractile force. So we spent some ATP pumping sodium out and potassium in to generate the electrochemical gradient that facilitates rapid signaling through the cardiac conduction system, SA node, AV node, Purkinje fibers, and then we're going to fire the myocyte. The signal to fire the myocyte and mediate a contractile cycle has to do with a rapid influx of calcium ions across the cell membrane. Contractile performance relates to the preexistent degree of stretch between the actin and myosin myofilaments and the quantity of calcium available to trigger the contractile cycle. When the heart is under stress, it will dilate the Frank Starling curve. When Aaron Rodgers wants to heave the football 60 yards in the end zone, he's extend his arm back as far as possible. The more calcium available to release the thick and thin filaments from its troponin and regulatory proteins, the more forceful will be the next cardiac cycle. So the myocyte is going to fire. There are invaginations within the myocyte cell membrane called T-tubules. So when this, the cell fires, calcium will rush in. Some of that calcium will interact with, with troponins to allow actinomycin ratcheting to initiate. Of greater importance, the calcium influx is sensed by the ryanodyne receptor on the sarcoplasmic reticulum that allows it to dump out its stored calcium. And so this influx of calcium will mediate the contractile cycle. At the beginning of diastole, we're going to spend ATP to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, back into the mitochondria. Calcium will pass the exchange for sodium, and the ATPase will exchange sodium for potassium. With each cycle of cysteine and diastole, calcium is rushing in. Calcium is going to be pumped out. Perhaps the most important thing that we can do in this hour is to unlearn the incorrect teaching that cardiotonic steroids, digoxin, and wabane mediate contractility by poisoning the sodium potassium ATPase. In this scenario, the ATPase cannot pump sodium out. There will be passive exchange um, of sodium out and calcium in. There's no more calcium available to mediate contractility. This is 100% incorrect, but 9 out of 10 papers that you will read will still cite this incorrect notion. Therapeutic levels of digoxin, dig levels that increase contractility and provide vagal effects, do not inhibit the pump. 
Rather, digoxin, a lipophilic molecule, creates calcium conduction channels within the cells. And of great importance, digoxin interacts with the riatidine receptor to mediate increased release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in response to cell depolarization. Digoxin does increase contractility, and it increases need for ATP, and it increases the requirement for oxygen, which is limiting if you have coronary atherosclerosis, and it increases the generation of reactive oxygen or reactive nitrogen species. Digoxin does not improve myocardial efficiency. It does not spare oxygen, but it does increase contractility, and that is its mechanism of clinical benefit. Now, toxic levels of digoxin will inhibit the ATPase. In this scenario, intracellular sodium rises, calcium will be passively exchanged, we have a calcium overload situation, this leads to mitochondrial dysfunction and cell death. A moderate increase in intracellular calcium is vagal syntonic. Excessive calcium will shift from parasympathetic to sympathetic dominance. Um, with, with excessive digoxin, there's no further increase in contractility. We switch from parasympathetic to sympathetic dominance, mitochondrial failure, and cell death. I'm in my mid-60s. If you're my age, think back to when you were an intern. Patient comes in with atrial fibrin heart failure. Your resident says, well, you need to digitalize them. So you give them a milligram of digoxin over 24 hours. The next morning, um, the heart rate's still kind of high. We'll add in some of this propranolol, this new beta blocker material that was available. The next day, you're rounding with your attending. The heart rate is still high, and the attending goes, well, increase the digoxin dose. The next day, you come by on rounds, and the bed is empty because the patient died of ventricular tachycardia. Low levels of digoxin will provide a vagal effect and increase contractility. Excessive digoxin will poison the pump, calcium overload, energy failure, and you die of sympathetic mediated ventricular arrhythmias. So is digoxin a good idea or a bad idea? The DITCH study looked at 6,700 patients with clinical findings of heart failure, all in sinus rhythm, mean ejection fraction 28%. They're all receiving standard medical therapy. The patients were randomized to receive over 37 months placebo or digoxin. The digoxin dose was left to the discretion of the clinician in range between 0.125 and 0.5 milligrams each day. There was no effective digoxin on overall mortality. However, death from heart failure decreased by 12%. Need for hospitalization or hospitalization for heart failure was also decreased. So if you're less likely to die of heart failure, but overall mortality is unchanged, that means with digoxin, you are more likely to die of something other than heart failure, and that would be ventricular arrhythmia due to digitalis toxicity. If you look back at the data from the precipitated paracelsus, you can see that relatively high, but still within what we would consider to be the therapeutic range, levels of digoxin is kind of like shooting poison arrows at your patients. Mortality at three years and hospitalization at three years was reduced with lower concentrations of digoxin, 0.5 to 0.8. As the digoxin dose increased, we see an increase in mortality and increased need for hospitalization. Low levels of digoxin will stimulate the riatidine receptor. We see increased contractility and a vagal effect. Greater doses of digoxin will poison the ATPase, leading to energy failure and a shift from parasympathetic to sympathetic dominance were more likely to experience ventricular arrhythmias. It is very easy to poison the pump with digoxin, a slightly increased dose. It is difficult to poison the pump with Wabane. It's probably impossible with oral dosing. To poison the pump with Wabane would require repetitive IV administration, something that we're not going to do. How does Wabane work? It stimulates the pump. It activates IP3R that leads to calcium oscillations that fills the sarcoplasmic reticulum with calcium. So we, we activate the pump. IP3R increases. 
There's more calcium oscillations. We're enhancing the stores of calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum and thus calcium availability to increase contractility. Now, because Wabin is also improving mitochondrial function, we're getting increased contractility without an increased need for oxygenated blood or ATP. We can compare and contrast digoxin to Wabin. We're not going to go through all this here. I do in a companion presentation that I'm working on. But suffice to say, digoxin can be considered a whip to beat the starving horse, while Wabain is oats for the starving myocardium. Microvascular ischemia, a functional disorder, relates to depressed sodium potassium ATPase cation pump function due to chronic overexpression of insulin, stress hormones, and reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. This pathobiology interacting with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and other atherosclerotic risk factors may also give rise to obstructive atherosclerosis, which of course may coexist with microvascular ischemia. In this situation, we have a fixed blockage that compromises the supply of oxygenated blood, rendering it insufficient to meet the needs of the exercising heart muscle. We have oxygen supply demand mismatch, and we have angina pectoris. Will y bane be of value in standard effort-induced angina. Well, based upon our understanding of the biological effects of Wabane, we would predict, yes, Wabane should be a value in effort-induced angina. This has been studied, and let's review some of these papers. Dr. Sauls and Schneider in 1985 reported on their experience utilizing Wabane in the treatment of 22 stable cornea patients in seven medical practices in Germany. This paper has not been translated, thus there may be some inaccuracies in my details. Incidentally, if any of you can read German, on the heartfixer.com website is a bibliography with every paper that I present and a number of review articles. If you could translate these papers for me or give me the highlights, I would appreciate it greatly. In any event, they took 22 patients who were stable seven medical practices, 18 were experiencing angina and what is described as giddiness. I imagine in the German papers, they were not using giddiness, but maybe malaise. Um, four were doing well. Anyways, they were randomized to receive oral Wabane or placebo. There was no benefit with placebo. On Wabane, 18 were doing well, only four with persistent symptoms. EKG findings improved in 19 of 22 and fully normalized in seven of 22. Dorman and Dorman, in a 1984 paper that has not been translated, looked at the effects of Wabane on 148 of their patients who were not doing well on medical therapy. All 148 subjects had antigraphically documented corneal disease, persistent symptoms despite medical therapy, which consisted of beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and long acting nitrate. They were experiencing medication related side effects. These patients were not satisfied with their clinical status. So, Dorman and Dorman stopped all their meds, a rather bold move from my perspective. They kept them on nitro as needed and began Wabane. I do not know the dose. At one week, 82% of their patients were pain free. At two weeks, 98% were pain free. Two experienced nuisance GI side effects and dropped out, and indeed, Rarely patients will experience GI side effects. Um, 146 were doing well. They continued with Wabane and did not return to standard medical therapy. Now, I've been using Wabane for two years. I'm quite comfortable recommending that my patients with micro or macrovascular ischemia, atrial fibrillation, or heart failure take Wabane. But 98% of my patients aren't pain free at two weeks. On the other hand, I'm not stopping their other medications. Early on, I was insecure with Wabane, and thus I used it only as an add-on therapy when patients were experiencing persistent symptoms despite medical therapy. More recently, I have been offering my patients Wabane as an initial treatment for angina. I really hadn't thought about it until looking at this paper but it may be that the incremental benefit of Wabane in my patients is better when I use Wabane as a initial therapy as opposed to an add-on. Now, why might that be? Well, we do appreciate that Wabane will not 
interfere with the therapeutic effects of standard drug therapy, but could standard drug therapy interfere with the effects of Wabane? Um, we know that Wabane initiates calcium oscillations. If we block calcium entry into the myocyte, could that compromise Wabane physiology? That is a logical question. We know that chronic overexpression of catecholamines desensitizes the ATPase, but an acute increase in adrenergic tone will actually enhance it. If we knock out adrenergic tone, could that be compromising ATPase activity? These are very interesting questions, and I'm going to be thinking about this and asking myself, does Wabane work better as an initial therapy? Are other standard medications compromising efficacy of Wabane? And I'm going to ask you to look at your patients in the same light. Wabane was manufactured in Germany by a number of pharmaceutical firms and marketed under different trade names such as Purostrophin, Strophoperm, or Stroferol. Herbert Pharma manufactured Wabane under the trade name of Strovidol, and they sent out their Wabane reps to talk to the 3,650 German practitioners who were using Wabane in their clinics and asked them, how are your patients doing on our product? 98.5% of the practitioners said they're, we're doing very well. The response was very positive. 1.5% had a positive response with some limitations. Quotes from the practitioners, excellently effective, no side effects, better than the rest, and I don't see deadly heart attacks anymore. I like that one. Brenbach exposed animals to progressive hypoxemia and found that Wabane pretreatment blunted the adverse myocardial effects. To quote Brenbach, the animal simply became resistant towards oxidation for hours. He then exposed corny patients to hypoxemia and found that concomitant Wabane therapy delayed the onset of hypoxia-induced angina. I missed this paper when it came out, but in my defense, in 1972, Deep Purple was playing smoke on the water. I was not interested in mitochondrial efficiency. Rather, I was interested in girls and playing tennis. And isn't it a shame that we all had to grow up? But grow up we did, and now we're dealing with all these patients with cardiovascular disease. In any event, Sharma and colleagues in 1972 took six men with stable effort-induced angina. They're on no meds except PRN nitro, all with abnormal supine bicycle stress EKG studies. You do a right and left heart catheterization, obviously via the brachial approach, determine the workload to induce angina at two to three minutes of a planned six minute study. Hematic measurements at rest and at minute six, then administer Wabane into the pulmonary artery, repeat the six minute stress test 30 minutes later at the same workload. The open rhomboid describes onset of angina and recovery. The darker rhomboid describes the same parameters with Wabane on board. In all six patients, onset of angina is delayed, recovery is enhanced, patient three experienced angina at baseline, no angina at the same workload with Wabane on board. Time to angina was delayed, recovery was shortened, total duration of symptoms was significantly attenuated by roughly 50%. Cardiac output increases with exercise stress, more so following the administration of Wabane. Heart rate increases with exercise, with or without Wabane, but stroke volume increases more following Wabane administration. Physical effort in a patient with obstructive coronary disease leads to myocardial oxygen supply mismatch. There's not enough oxygen available to generate ATP. There's less ATP available to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to mediate diastolic function. We have a rise in left endoscopic pressure, shortness of breath. With Wabine on board, there's an oxygen sparing effect. Mitochondrial function is enhanced, more ATP available to mediate proper diastolic function, EDP does not rise as much, we have less shortness of breath with effort. Wabane enhances contractility at rest by making more calcium available to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to mediate systolic function. With exercise, we have a rise in catecholamines. 
an acute rise in catecholamines stimulates the ATPase and renders it more sensitive to the stimulatory effects of wobbing. So with exercise alone, we see an increase in contractility. Exercise with wobbing on board, there's a synergy, a further increase in contractile function, a greater rise in LV DPDT. To summarize, wobbing is a value in angina, both microvascular and macrovascular etiology. What are the mechanisms of benefit? Wobbing improves metabolic efficiency. We generate more ATP without a concomitant increase in oxygen requirement. Red cell and platelet flow through the capillary network is preserved. Wobbing attenuates metabolic acidosis. Angina is actually our perception of the generation of metabolic acids within the myocardium. Extrapolating from animal models, Wabain improves endothelial function. Wabain has a salutary balancing effect on autonomic tone, increasing parasympathetic and inhibiting sympathetic expression. More rest and repair, less fight or flight. Now, a short-term increase in catecholamines is salutary. It mediates the increase in contractility with physical effort. Catecholamines will acutely enhance the sensitivity of the ATPase to the stimulatory effects of wobbing. However, chronic overexpression of catecholamines and other stress hormones will downregulate ATPase activity, rendering it less sensitive to the stimulatory effects of wobbing. Indeed, chronic sympathetic overexpression may mediate much of the pump dysfunction in the setting of chronic heart failure, the treatment of which with wobbing is the subject of our final section. Oxidative stress is the key driving force underlying atherosclerosis, heart failure, and hypertension. Oxidative stress plays a role in arrhythmia and renal dysfunction. Oxidative stress is the mechanism through which errors in diet and lifestyle lead to age-related hyperlipidemia and essentially all other age-related degenerative conditions with which our patients present. Let's look at the effect of oxidative stress on ATPase expression. We're going to take myocardial ATPase and in vitro incubate it with superoxide and downstream free radical species peroxide, hydroxyl, and hypochloric acid or stimulated neutrophils, which will generate copious amounts of superoxide, which will then be converted to these downstream free radical species. We'll look at the effects of incubation of ATPase with these free radical species on ATPase functional expression and the ability of wabane to bind to the ATPase, its natural receptor. A number of physiologic and pathophysiologic processes can lead to excessive generation of superoxide with resultant oxidative stress. From our perspective, that of the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease the two key enzymatic sources of excessive superoxide are xanthine oxidase and NADPH oxidase. Xanthine oxidase expression upregulates in the presence of inflammatory and oxidative stress. Xanthine oxidase, in turn, wastes precious oxygen to generate uric acid and superoxide free radical. Xanthine oxidase thus amplifies the oxidative cascade. If you have single vessel corneal disease, we know that xanthine oxidase will upregulate tenfold in that narrowed vessel. Now, your systemic level of uric acid will thus be low, but within the ischemic vasculature, uric acid and superoxide generation will be elevated and you'll be wasting oxygen. If you're living with allopurinol, you'll spare oxygen, you'll make less superoxide, angina will attenuate. Via this mechanism, allopurinol has been shown to improve outcome in heart attack and open heart surgery. Allopurinol will also attenuate to some degree all of the metabolic consequences of the metabolic syndrome because it's blunting oxidative stress. When the kidneys reabsorb uric acid, this process generates free radical species, which is damaging to the kidneys. So 100 milligrams of allopurinol will delay progression of kidney dysfunction and protect these patients from cardiovascular events.
NADPH oxidase is such a powerful superoxide generator that in the resting state, it is kept disassembled. In response to a threat, a real threat such as infection or a pseudo-infectious threat, NADPHX oxidase assembles and generates copious amounts of superoxide. So in this study, you're going to incubate myocardial ATPase with superoxide generated from xanthine oxidase or with discrete downstream free radical species, peroxide, hydroxyl, hypochlorous acid, or with stimulated polys that are going to crank up NADPH oxidase expression to make superoxide, and then this will be converted to uh, peroxide, hydroxyl, and hypochloric acid as you would want in the setting of infection. Now, again, the only free radical we make is superoxide. That's physiologic. Superoxide is dismutated, detoxified to hydrogen peroxide by superoxidismutase. We need hydrogen peroxide for physiologic signaling. So we need some tonic level of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide generation. Excessive peroxide, not necessary for physiologic signaling, will be detoxified to water by catalase and glutathione peroxidase. So when we are making normal amounts of superoxide and our mineral-based antioxidant enzyme defenses are functioning normally, we do not experience downstream oxidative stress. In contrast, if we're generating excessive amounts of superoxide and if our antioxidant enzymes are not functioning normally due to mineral deficiency or perhaps toxicity, the superoxide will go into peroxide. We're not going to neutralize to uh, water. And then the superoxide and peroxide will be converted to downstream free radical species, which are 10 to 1,000 times more powerful prooxidants than are the parent compounds superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Now, this is appropriate when you're dealing with infection, but when you're dealing with the pseudo-infectious milieu, of Western man that's leading to cardiovascular disease, then the excessive free radicals are oxidizing lipids, they're damaging the cell membrane, they're damaging enzyme systems, and they're leading to accelerated cardiovascular disease and all other age-related degenerative diseases which plague Western society. So what the investigators found was that ATPase expression in the ability of Wavain to ligate and stimulate ATPase was unaffected by superoxide. Again, superoxide is a physiologic molecule. However, ATPase activity and Wavain ATPase binding was strongly inhibited by downstream free radical species, peroxide, hydroxyl, hypochloric acid, and activated neutrophils. So if hydro groups within the ATPase um, enzyme would be oxidized by these downstream free radicals, blunting ligation of Wavain to the ATPase. So we don't want to let the horse out of the barn. We don't want to let superoxide to generate in excess and be converted to the downstream free radical species if we want our ATPase system to function normally. I've been practicing cardiology for 35 years. Roughly 30 years ago, I began to place my patients on vitamin E, vitamin C, and bioflavonoids. This was suggested to me by Dr. Terry Chappell, and these are effective therapies today. But what we know now, what we want to do is close the barn door. Now, we want to identify and resolve conditions that lead to excessive superoxide generation. Of course, we want to do that, but that's a time-consuming uh, project. In the meantime, we can close the barn door by supporting superoxide dismutase with mineral supplementation, and we can intervene with exogenous superoxide dismutase, gleason and superoxide dismutase from the melon plant, bound to a molecule gleason to the render it absorbable. If we take gleason, our levels of superoxide dismutase will increase, as will levels of catalase and glutathione peroxidase. Now, we're not supplying these enzymes exogenously, but by lowering levels of oxidative stress, these enzymes are spared. Gleason has been shown to lower oxidative stress and to retard the progression of atherosclerosis as evidenced by carotid intermediate thickness testing. We can also use pomegranate, which stimulates peroxidase, the antioxidant enzyme associated with HDL, to blunt LDL oxidation. And we can use a comprehensive program of fat and water-soluble antioxidants. 
and agents to support glutathione to deal with oxidative stress. Our patients come in with low levels of glutathione, high levels of lip peroxide, we begin to treat them and we see a shift to if we lower the levels of oxidative stress, then we can have confidence that all their cardiovascular syndromes and essentially all their age-related generative conditions will attenuate. High level generation of superoxide and downstream reactive oxygen nitrogen species is appropriate when we deal with legitimate infection, but it's maladaptive when we're dealing with the pseudo-infectious milieu of modern man. There are many sources of inappropriate superoxide generation. We experience oxidative stress. All of our risk factors lead to oxidative stress. Oxidative stress in turn aggravates our risk factors. Vicious cycles develop that we need to break. To learn more about oxidative stress and the role of oxidative stress in cardiovascular disease, I refer you to chapter three, atherosclerotic oxidative stress, a maladaptive mucin response to perceived mental infection within personalized and precision integrative cardiovascular medicine and integrative cardiology textbook edited by Mark Houston in chapter three, we catalog all the causes of oxidative stress, the enzyme systems involved, um, how we can measure oxidative stress, and of course, how we can attenuate oxidative stress with drug and non-drug methodologies. In chapter three, I do not mention Wabane or the ATPase because I didn't know about Wabane or the ATPase three years ago when this book was being put together, but we do understand Wabane and ATPase function now and we know that oxidative stress will downregulate HS expression as does hyperinsulinemia and heightened adrenergic tone which we're going to cover over the next few slides before we complete this presentation with a discussion of the role of Wabane in dealing with congestive heart failure. HEPase expression is impaired in the failing human heart and this can be quantified in ventricular biopsy tissue. I used to do this. I got pretty good at it. We had a catheter with a forceps tip. We would drop it into the ventricle, take a little bite and pull back. And you have to pull back kind of hard. The patient feels this little jolt. And they get over that. And it's important, of course, to biopsy the interventricular septum and not the right the free wall because then it can perforate and they go into tamponade and that slows down production in the cath lab. It's kind of frowned upon. These days, I think my patients would rather just take Wabane and coenzyme Q and skip the biopsy. But in any event, the normal level for ATPase expression is 700 picomoles per gram wet tissue, similar values in the right ventricle and left ventricle. There's a linear inverse relationship between ATPase expression and ejection fraction and heart failure. When patients go into heart failure, you typically see a 25% decrease in ATPase expression. There's an 80% reduction when the ejection fraction falls to 20%. Digoxin therapy curiously decreases ATPase expression by an additional 15%. Another study, 24 subjects with dilated cardiomyopathy, five were doing well, ATPase level was 559, 19 with impaired functional status, poor LV function, ATPase level was 331. 43 subjects with advanced pump dysfunction. 23 are in shock, undergoing biventricular assist device placement. 22 had advanced but compensated heart failure. They are being prepared for transplantation. Now the patients in shock had lower ejection fraction, 17% versus 22%. ATP myocardial content was extremely depressed, 28 versus 119. And ATPase expression was lower, 4 to 98 versus 425. ATP and ATPase expression fall in tandem with a falling ejection fraction. Why is this? We know that acute increases in catecholamines and in insulin will increase ATPase expression, but chronic overexpression of catecholamines, insulin, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, the pathophysiology that is found in heart failure will depress ATPase function. So as you would expect, ATPase expression drops in the presence of heart failure. This study examined the link between sympathetic overactivity and mortality in heart failure from a different angle. Here we're gonna look at 120 patients with stable chronic heart failure, mean ejection fraction 
You'll measure left ventricular ejection fraction and other disease-related characteristics. Forearm blood flow, which is a reflection primarily of endothelial function and secondarily of forward cardiac output. And muscle sympathetic nerve activity, the rate of sympathetic firing within the peritoneal nerve. They felt that this was a better indicator of ambient sympathetic tone than simply measuring serum norepinephrine, which of course is going to be elevated in the setting of heart failure. One year mortality was 28% and the investigators related mortality to variations in these baseline characteristics. Univariate predictors of one year survival were low ejection fraction, left ventricular chamber dilatation, elevated heart rate, poor forearm blood flow, and elevated muscle sympathetic nerve activity. However, multivariate predictors were confined to poor forearm blood flow and elevated sympathetic tone as assessed by muscle sympathetic nerve activity. They created cutoff points, and these Kaplan-Meier survival curves show that if sympathetic nerve activity is low, outcome is favorable. If it is high, you're more likely to die. The same thing with forearm blood flow, which is endothelial dysfunction of forward cardiac output. If it's preserved, you do well. If it's poor, you're not likely to do well. This makes sense because sympathetic overexpression leads to oxidative stress that leads to endothelial dysfunction. Sympathetic overexpression, oxidative stress will also downregulate expression of the ATPase. If chronic upregulation in sympathetic tone leads to a concomitant downregulation in myocardial ATPase expression, will beta blocker therapy provide an ameliorative effect? In this study, dogs received either sham surgery or they underwent pulmonary banding and tricuspid valve avulsion to create experimental right ventricular volume or pressure overload, while left ventricular hemodynamics remained intact. Half the animals received a beta blocker natalol over weeks two to five and at week six, you're going to look at ATPase expression in the right ventricle and the left ventricle is assessed by radiolabeled wabine binding. With sham surgery, ATPase expression was normal and beta blocker therapy had no significant effect. In the animals undergoing experimental right heart failure with heightened adjuric tone, as you would expect, ATPase expression is decreased by nearly 50% while concomitant beta blocker therapy provide a significant ameliorative effect. In the animals who underwent right heart failure, but their left ventricle is intact, but they're subject to systemic heightened adjuric tone, AT base expression was decreased in the left heart, and that was fully normalized with concomitant beta blocker therapy. So it doesn't really matter what the cause of heart failure is, heightened sympathetic tone will lead to a systemic downregulation in ATVS expression. Now let's move on to the use of Wabane in the treatment of congestive heart failure. Wabane is of obvious value in corneal insufficiency, and Wabane attenuates signs and symptoms of ischemic diastolic and systolic pump dysfunction, which are essentially reflections of transient heart failure. Now, will Wabine be of value in the setting of chronic heart failure? The ischemic myocyte and the family myocyte both suffer from insufficient ATP generation. In the setting of corneal insufficiency, oxygen is limiting. In heart failure, outside of the setting of ischemic cardiomyopathy, oxygen is not limiting. There's plenty of glucose, there's plenty of fatty acids to metabolize, yet, ATP generation is insufficient. This brings us to the question of physiologist Dr. Tagmeyer, why does the heart fail in the midst of plenty? Dr. Furstenworth, who's written a number of really good review articles on Wabane, describes Wabane as oats for the starving myocardium. I'm going to paraphrase Dr. Furstenworth and describe Wabane as oats for the downregulated ATPase. This study carried out by Dr. Guisipi and colleagues in 1994, I believe before the European patent on Wabane expired, answers this important question. They took 22 patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, put them in the hospital, baseline measurements, randomized them to receive over three months, 
intravenous Wavane versus oral digoxin. You repeat the baseline measurements at two weeks and three months, wash them out for two weeks, and then cross them over to the opposite therapy and repeat the assessments. At two weeks and three months, ejection fraction rose three points with digoxin, a comparable improvement in ejection fraction with Wavane. Cardiac index improved to a greater degree with Wavane. Heart rate decreased in both groups due to improved cardiac performance, and when we increase intracytoplasmic calcium, we provide a vagal effect. Norepinephrine did not change significantly with digoxin. It fell dramatically with Wavane. That's very important because high norepinephrine correlates with a poor outcome in chronic heart failure. Why? Because norepinephrine desensitizes the ATPase. Treadmill time improves modestly with digoxin. It improves to a greater degree with Wavane. Peak oxygen uptake and oxygen uptake and anaerobic threshold an index of the amount of work that can be accomplished changes minimally with digoxin. It improves significantly with Wavane therapy. There were no side effects or alterations in electrolytes or renal chemistries in either group. Here we'll look at stroke index at baseline. It rises with digoxin. It rises a little bit more with Wavane. Cardiac index rises more with Wavane. Heart rate falls and ejection fraction rises in both groups. Peripheral resistance falls more with Wavane, correlating with a dramatic reduction in norepinephrine. Treadmill time functional status improves a little bit with digoxin, a lot more with Wavane. Both agents increase ejection fraction by increasing the quantity of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum available to mediate contractile function. But Wavane and not digoxin enhances mitochondrial function, enhances HP energy generation. Wabane blunts norepinephrine release, lowering heart rate, lowering vascular resistance. Wabane increases oxygen uptake, not cardiac oxygen requirement, which falls, but muscular oxygen utilization improves because the sodium potassium ATPase in skeletal muscle is downregulated in heart failure due to chronic over elaboration of stress hormones. We rectify that with Wavane. Cardiac function and skeletal mu muscle function improves with Wavane, thus improved functional status. Several papers have been published that have been translated demonstrating benefits of IV Wavane in heart failure. Papers discussing oral Wavane have not been translated, but in my two-year experience with Wavane, I can say that yes, Wavane is helping in chronic congestive heart failure, as you would expect based upon your understanding of the physiologic effects of Wavane. Wavane was used not just in Europe, but in the United States in the treatment of chronic heart failure. Dr. Chavez treated over 1,000 patients and summarized his observations in this 1943 report. According to Dr. Chavez, the best fields for the application of Wavane are the acute phenomenon of failure of the left ventricle and chronic failure of the left side of the heart in patients with cardiac disease, such as coronary arterial sclerosis, hypertension, etc. Patients who suffer from long nights of insomnia and from the torment of dyspnea and crisis of asthma sleep like children once again after the first injection or at most after the second or third one. Patients who have resisted digitalis rapidly recover under the action of Wavane. Its effect on nocturnal dyspnea in patients with cardiac disease is comparable only to that of morphine. This slide comes from a companion presentation I'm working on regarding the history of Wavane. Dr. Ernst Edens won the Nobel Prize in 1930. He made a breakthrough with the application of Wavane in the treatment of heart failure and in the prevention of heart attack. According to Dr. Edens, IV Wavane is the safest approach in angin heart attack, whereas digitalis is contraindicated. Wavane lowers blood pressure in patients with cardiovascular disease. Wavane resolves arrhythmia and EKG changes in digitalis toxicity. There's the potential for toxicity with Wavane with overly rapid IV administration, but not with orally administered Wavane. According to Dr. Edens, the time will come in which failure to timely start Wavane therapy will be condemned as malpractice. The Wavane story began in Zanzibar over 150 years ago with Sir Jonathan Kirk. Berthold Kern championed the use of Wavane in German medicine in the 50s, 60s, and 70s.
Dr. Thomas Cowan brought the use of Wabane back to the attention of American physicians roughly 10 years ago. The leading researcher in the ATPase cation pump and signal transduction system was the recently departed Amir Askari. Dr. Askari was my professor in medical school. He was a very good professor. And he did talk to us about the ATPase system. But I don't recall Dr. Askari talking to us about Wabine. And my other professors in medical school and in my internal medicine and invasive cardiology training did not mention Wabane. And I didn't learn about Wabane until just a few years ago. But with my interest in Wabane, I sought out Dr. Ascari. Now, Dr. Ascari remained intellectually vibrant until the time of his passing. Papers with his name on it are still coming out, and he remained physically active. Dr. Ascari lived on my jogging route, and I would run by. He'd be out in the garden wearing a straw hat. I'd wave at him. He'd wave back. And later in life, he moved into the same retirement community where my dad lives. They probably had lunch together. So I had all these questions for Dr. Ascari, but I was too late. So I'll have to delay these questions that I have for Dr. Ascari for another 30 years. But this is Dr. Ascari later in life at a meeting where I believe they were talking about mechanisms to bring Wabane back to the forefront of American medicine and make Wabane available to doctors and to patients or to people who don't want to be our patients. Because again, you don't need a prescription to take Wabane. So who might this be? This guy, and it will come as no surprise to any of you, happens to be my best friend and colleague, R.H. Poling, the great, 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 great grandson of Jonathan Kirk. Dr. Poling brought the Wabane story to my attention several years ago. Together, we went through 100 articles, and these are all listed on the heartfixer.com website. We thought about and decided that this would be a good approach to our patients. But of course, it's new or it's new to us. So maybe we should take a dose first to make sure it's okay before we give it to the patients. And we had Wabane as red pills and blue pills. So we we're deciding who should take the first dose, me or Dr. Poling. And the patients go, Dr. Roberts, you should take the first pill. Well, why? Well, Dr. Roberts, something goes wrong. The loss to society would not be as great. Say it otherwise, the world might spin more truly around its axis with the weight of one less allopathically trained invasive cardiologist slowing things down. So I took the red pill. I did okay. Poling took the red pill. He did okay. Now our patients are taking Wabane and benefiting greatly. And we hope that your patients will also benefit from Wabane and this knowledge. How do we get Wabane into the hands of our patients? And what are appropriate initial dosing guidelines? Wabane is typically provided at the three milligram per dose level. Over the past two years, my patients have been taking Wabane in capsule form, marked under the trade name Stropantol. Recently, we learned about Wabane in tablet form, which is marketed under the trade name Stropanthin. If you take the capsules, you can open them up, sprinkle the powder under your tongue, swish it around, and then swallow it. This likely enhances absorption. If you take capsules or tablets, oral dosing is best on an empty stomach. If you take wabbing with food, absorption will be compromised. Our standard dose in angina, atrial heart failure, is three milligrams on day one, three milligrams twice a day on day two, three milligrams three times a day to follow. The dose could be advanced up to six milligrams three times a day if needed. I don't think we can hurt anybody with Wabane at this dosing level. I think to hurt somebody with Wabane would require high dose and repetitive intravenous dosing, which we are not going to apply. If the patient benefits from Wabane, after a period of time, you can begin to taper down the dose and often symptoms will remain improved. How is this possible? Well, with standard allopathic drug medicine, we are inhibiting an enzyme system that is pathologically upregulated. If we don't address the causes of enzyme system pathologic upregulation, and typically we don't in allopathic medicine, we need to maintain drug therapy lifelong. 
with wobbing, we're stimulating an endogenous enzyme system that is pathologically downregulated. And when we open up the ATPase, a number of good things happen. Energy generation improves. Endothelial function improves. Parasympathetic tone is enhanced. Sympathetic tone is decreased. We generate lower levels of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. So the phenomenon that downregulated ATPase physiology, adrenergic stress, hyperlincinemia, excessive elaboration of free radical species are attenuated. Thus, ATPase activity normalizes on its own and lifelong wobbing therapy may not be necessary. If you're having a heart attack, the standard dose is 6 to 12 milligrams sublingually as soon as possible. I think I would opt for the 12 milligram dose. Up until recently, up until COVID, our patients were obtaining stropantol from a European supplier, $60 to $70 per month. Shipping was roughly two weeks. With the onset of COVID, shipping from Europe became problematic and then it ceased, so they shut down. They've recently opened up again. They've renamed their product Optisan. I believe it's still stropantol. We have not gotten our initial dose yet, but you can obtain this material from Optisan.com. We can also obtain stropantol directly from Dr. Cowan. You go to DrTomCowan.com, click shop, click Stropanthus, and you could obtain Wabame for $105 a month plus shipping. It's more expensive. I believe it's the same material. We also learned about a Canadian supplier of Wabane in tableted form. Here, the cost is $203. That includes shipping for a two-month supply. The Canadian supplier did not want their contact information to be put into this presentation. I understand this because regulatory agencies do not look fondly at institutions that want to help people get better outside of the dependency relationship on big pharma and big medicine, but on the heartfixer.com website, I will update a list of providers of Wabane. And if any of you know of other suppliers of Wabane, I would appreciate this knowledge and I can include it into the website. Stropanthus is available in ticture form. On the webs on websites, they talk about homeopathic versions of Stropanthus. Some of you are skilled in botanical medicine. Some of you are skilled in homeopathy. Many of you are well versed in digital homeopathy and you might be able to make imprints of stropanthin. If this works for you, please let me know and I would like to be able to pass this information on to others. The lower the cost, the more people can benefit from Wabane, the better that is for all of us. Wabane is the natural ligand of the ubiquitous cell membrane sodium potassium ATPase, which functions as a cation pump, as the plasmarosome, and as the signalosome. ATPase expression will be downregulated in the setting of chronic hyperinsulinemia or in settings where stress hormones, catecholamines, or reactive oxygen nitrogen species are overexpressed. Essentially, the phenotype of our patients in this setting, cardiovascular physiology is compromised and clinical symptoms will follow. When the ATPase is pathologically downregulated, exogenous Wabane will restore proper ATPase function, allowing a recovery of normal cardiovascular physiology and an improvement in the clinical status of our patients. As we're not poisoning, an enzyme system that is pathologically upregulated, but rather stimulating an enzyme system that is sluggish, there's no potential for harm with Wabane. How does Wabane work? What are the physiologic effects of Wabane? Mitochondrial function is enhanced, increased ATV generation without a concomitant increase in oxygen requirement. Wabane promotes increased contractility without an increased need for oxygenated blood. Wabane promotes utilization as opposed to generation of lactic acid when the heart is metabolically strained. Wabane synergizing with insulin improves uptake and assimilation of glucose when aerobic energy generation is compromised. Glycolysis becomes more efficient. Wabane stimulates parasynthetic while inhibiting sympathetic expression with Wabane therapy norepinephrine levels fall. Wabane conditions the mitochondria 
Wabane turns this into pearl divers, lessening the risk of energy failure and cell loss when the heart is stressed by oxygen insufficiency, catecholaminic stress, or infection or inflammation. Plasticity of red cells and platelets is enhanced, the mechanism of benefit in microvascular ischemia. In vitro and animal studies demonstrate that Wabane improves endotheotome. Wabane initiates protein synthesis. This plays a role in adaptive hypertrophy and other functions. Wabane may mediate some benefits of exercise. Wabane may limit inflammatory cytokine generation. Wabane is necessary for prenatal development. With our understanding of the physiologic effects of Wabane, we can also understand the clinical effects of Wabane. Wabane is of well-documented and significant value in reducing symptoms and increasing effort capacity in patients with standard obstructive epicardial coronary disease. Wabane improves functional status in patients with heart failure on the basis of pump dysfunction or valvular insufficiency. Wabane rapidly resolves symptoms in patients with microvascular ischemia if the problem is faulty sodium potassium ATPase cation pump function. Wabane improves functional status in patients with atrial fib and atrial flutter while providing a modest reduction in heart rate. Wabane is an endogenous substance. Wabane is generated in the adrenal glands and within the hypothalamus. Wabane is the natural ligand of the sodium potassium ATPase. As such, Wabane is intrinsically safe. With oral dosing at the three to six milligram three times a level, we can't hurt anybody with Wabane. There are no adverse interactions between Wabane and other drugs, other than as pathophysiology improves, it might be appropriate to decrease the dose of other drugs on board. While there's a theoretical rationale for co-administration of Wabane and digoxin, and this is described in German papers that have not been translated, there's at least the theoretical potential for antagonism in that I know that you can treat ditch talus toxicity with Wabane. Thus, I don't think we should be using Wabane and digoxin together, at least not, not now. The biggest constraint we have is that 98% of U.S. physicians, including me and probably you until recently, are unaware of the benefits of Wabane or incorrectly liken Wabane to digoxin and thus inappropriately fear Wabane toxicity. Our patients are not going to experience side effects with Wabane. The worst thing that can happen with Wabane is that they don't get better, but this is all new to our patients. It's new to most American physicians. Thus, you need to educate your patients and the doctors you work with regarding the benefits of Wabane and feel free to refer your patients to this presentation. This is designed for physicians, but our patients are the smartest patients in the world. They're gonna be a follow this. And later on this summer, I will have companion presentations designed for patients. Likely benefits of Wabane, and here I'm saying likely because I've not read the papers myself because they haven't been translated, or I may be extrapolating a benefit of Wabane from animal models of cardiovascular disease states. Wabane in the German literature has been shown to reduce mortality, improve outcome in acute infarction. Here are six, 12 milligrams of Wabane's taken with the onset of chest pain. Chronic Wabane use should decrease risk of heart attack and reduce muscle loss and improve outcome if a Wabane treated patient experiences an MI. Preoperative Wabane was used in Germany and it was shown to improve outcome in on pump open heart surgery. Wabane may protect against the development of heart failure in pressure overload cardiac strain states. Wabane seem to improve mood and sense of optimism. I've seen this in my patients. Wabane is said to improve athletic performance. We can use Wabane to differentiate cardiac from non-cardiac symptoms in the physician's office. This is Stropanth and Quick Test. I think this works. And IV Wabane was used in Germany and the United States to deal with perioperative shock. This concludes our presentation on the utility of Wabane in cardiovascular disease. I appreciate your time and attention. And Dr. Ascari, if you're looking down on us, perhaps having a drink with my mom, I hope that this work of your medical student meets with your approval. Thank you.